everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be your moderator this evening as we do a special kind of travel tonight, time travel. Tonight, we have our special guest, Rick Steves, and his special guest, Gene Openshaw. Now, again, please put your travel dreams in the upright and locked position, as I have the pleasure to introduce our tour guide for the evening, Rick Steves. Welcome, Rick. Lisa. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us on Monday Night Travel. I just love getting people together and showing slides. <laughs> That's what I was doing 50 years ago. And, you know, it just occurred to me, I've been at this for 50 years. 50 years ago, I graduated from high school and had the best trip of my life with my good buddy, Gene Openshaw. And uh, I've been working on this whole idea of teaching travel, of collaborating, We've had this wonderful business. I can't stop working because I have so much fun and I get to drink a lot of nice wine. Uh, right now I'm gonna drink a little red wine. I hope you've got something that can take you back to your travel memories. This is uh, from the Cantucci Vineyard and this is Vino Nobile di Montepulciano from Tuscany. It's just, this is just Vino Rosso Corposo. That's what this is. And I've been thinking how lucky I am to have had good creative partners and a business that works and you put it all together and it's just very gratifying. And Gene and I were talking about all the fun we've had over the last 50 years since we went to that teenage graduation after trip after graduation. And we thought we could put together a little story for you. And we're gonna do that right now. And I'd like you to give a big rousing virtual welcome to my buddy and collaborator, Gene Openshaw. Gene, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's great to be here. Yeah, <laughs> what a nice Monday night gathering. This is great. And we're going to go do some just some memories. And uh, you know, I mentioned collaborating and I mentioned business. Um, you you came up with this idea. What do you what are we going to do? Well, you know, we have been part of this thing for a half century, if you can think of a half century. And it seems to me that there's a certain through line in everything that we've done. There's mm -hmm. a kind of backdoor spirit that has driven everything that both you and I have done collaborating, as well as your company, as it grew and carried on through the decades, right from the very first time that you and I took a trip to Europe as teenagers back in 1973, all the way up until today, until right at this very moment when we're sharing some wine on a screen here. And we've been, well, let's just get into it, Gene, because this is, I'm just really excited to kind of reminisce with you and, and with all of our Monday Night Travel friends watching us. And with the magic of our art department here, there are, there's my- My goodness, the, who the are Ricky. those young people? <laughs> or I should say, who are those old people standing in front? Man, that's us then and now. Well, I don't think we could have envisioned that, that back then in 1973, <laughs> you know, but we're going to go on a journey. Tell us what we're going to do in the very beginning here. Well, it says that the journey begins in 1973, but just a little setup. We'll get into Lisa's way back machine and go back a few years when you and I first met, which I believe was in junior high, I think in band class. I think so. And just think of the times then we were sort of we we were sort of free range kids and and the spirit of the times was go out and explore follow your dreams and don't worry about taking the road less traveled i think that's what these two guys what a couple of punks wow but i think is that's what these two guys were about ready to do when this photo was taken our senior year graduation is approaching and then suddenly you get this harebrained idea to go to europe so we go to the airport. This was Boeing Field, not Seattle Tacoma International Airport, Boeing <laughs> Field. We're on some kind of a, you know, German charter flight and we're flying to Europe with three dollars a day in our pockets. And uh, uh, we say goodbye to the girlfriend. We say goodbye to our moms and dads. And uh, we are on we, our way. And here we and go. We didn't really know what to expect. I mean, look at our look at those packs we're wearing. <laughs> we didn't even know what to pack. Well, it looks like we're going hiking in the Cascades there. We got two tents, we got <laughs> sleeping bags. I got my Boy Scout metal uh, mess kit. Uh, look at those hardy, look at those uh, very high tech uh, walking shoes that we got on there. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we're going to first period, not off to a two and a half hour, two and a half month uh, trip across Europe. 
external backpacks, Gene, uh, you know, and, and uh, my, my idea was just get the biggest backpack you can find and fill that sucker. I had no idea about packing light. We had no idea what we were going to be doing, but it, it just opened up like a beautiful well, flower. Wow. Yeah. So we flew across there and wow, everything was new. Every single day was new. Rome, Paris, Athens, Amsterdam, Castles, castles on the Rhine. Oh yeah, and discovering things. You know, even when we were just on recess, we were discovering things, and we were realizing this is really, really exciting. What a great opportunity! What a great way to spend the summer. Yeah, we saw all the icons, but we also saw a lot of these back doors. In fact, this is a castle that ha that became part of later part of the best of Europe trip. That's right. This is and just we've discovered it in 73. All the tourists are at Mad Ludwig's Castle, Neuschwanstein, and this is a half hour drive to the south in Austria. And we hike up to that ruined castle. And uh, just in the last few years, I've hiked up to that same very castle, gone through that same very gate with our travelers. And we also introduced ourselves. We were just bumpkins to high art, to culture. You're right. When you say bumpkins, I mean, neither of us grew up in a highly cultured family. We were small town kids from basically blue collar roots. We didn't know anything about art. I remember though seeing this statue of David blew me away. And I think even just that experience there might have set me on a path that led to where we are today. Well, think about that because uh, I went to school and studied what I was supposed to study to be successful. You know, I was gonna be a lawyer and uh, poli sci. I got sidetracked after traveling and I ended up just uh, taking all sorts of creative classes uh, and got a history degree kind of accidentally and you did too. Uh, it, yeah, it, I think this 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 trip really rewired our brains. Yeah. Uh, and so that and, but and this also did too. remember, you know, this was all wonderful and we saw this and it was so great and everything, but it was pretty hard travel. We lived for two and a half months on nothing but hard <laughs> rolls and jam. This was fine dining because it was a step above bread and jam. <laughs> we had yeah. steel rolls from the breakfast breakfast table. We sang you know, a we, song called Kodachrome. Kodachrome was a hit that year. And we, what do uh, we say? Uh, when I think back on all the crap I ate in Europe, okay. it's a wonder we are here at all. And my, bread and oh, jam. my lack. <laughs> Oh, oh, and yeah. the, the, yeah. the lyrics just get get worse. Um, but 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 we were in the streets. We were and, and we had that one oasis, my relatives in Norway, where we could just go for a for a, for a, for a full meal and a little home cooking. This was like halftime in the, in the football game. We got this this pause right in the middle of the trip where we could gorge ourselves and restore the tissues and get ready to move on. And that was before there was any kind of commun easy communication. We had no money for phone calls. We were writing aerograms and we were picking up mail at uh, mail depots around Europe. And of course, one of them would have been the relatives in Norway. Yeah, well, I think we did this whole trip on what was it? Something like $600 or something, a two and a half month trip. It was just ridiculous. I think with, with the price. airfare, Gene, with the airfare, the two month rail pass and uh, $3 a day, um, you know, that's that's what we did. Here's that. And with that, we hit the highs and we hit the lows and we've got a million memories. And this is the historical document that that uh, uh, that records it all. Let me you know, we, this is this is I thought this was so fun. We spent the flight going flying home, making we each made a fresco. We each had a piece of paper. We outlined it with this train line. It was Europe, Rick and Jean, 1973. And we took turns uh, illustrating every other frame. And each one of these frames, I mean, there we are, the casino in Monte Carlo with a boot. We must have got oh. kicked out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we weren't exactly James Bond, that's for we, sure. We weren't welcome there. We went into Morocco. That looked pretty exotic. And yeah. uh, we had some uh, uh, trouble with our intestines, it looks yeah. like. Got the, all the big things in Paris, Eiffel Tower, Mona Lisa. We ate really well in the Netherlands. And looks like we slept out on the on the dike there next to the windmills and the sea. And I don't want to ask what the sex <laughs> thing is. Let's just move on and we'll <laughs> look at us, Dean. We had halos in our eyes covered there. So oh, that's us. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's good. And then, in, you know, the whole Dachau and the concentration camp thing impacted us. Everything was impacting us on this trip. And when we came home, 70 days later, 
I think we were completely say, changed. I, I think we were changed. I really, and, really and, do. And we were expected then to go off to college. We just came trucking home, looking great, looking mm. forward to the future. But we didn't know what college was going to bring. And like you said, I too was going to be on the fast track to be an attorney or something like that. And instead, I think because of this trip, I, I made college itself a journey of discovery. Mm -hmm. And then what? And then when we finished college, we were just you and I on to the very next adventure. So the day after we graduated from high school, we flew to Europe. The, right after we both graduated from college, we took the hippie trail. And the hippie trail was like it was from Europe to India. We go trucking off, following in the footsteps of so many of the hippies who in the 60s went going across Asia by land looking for exotic locales and drugs and uh, the Maharishi and religious enlightenment. And we we followed that same same trail, but it was a hard trip. There's no denying. In fact, you and I, one of our current projects is our publisher is all hot to publish this book. This is just a little self-published version of it that I did from my journal. But uh, you're going to spearhead the production of a hardback book that's going to come out in 2025, which takes us on this hippie trail, because it really was for you and me. Uh, it, it introduced us to the world, really, taking that bus from Istanbul to Kathmandu. Yeah, across the deserts of Turkey and Iran and Afghanistan, led by this guy, uh, the, our, our, our bus driver. You know you're on a different kind of bus tour when the bus driver pulls the, 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 the bus over on the side of the road and says, everybody out, you're all jumping into that river over there because we're not going far one mile farther until everybody takes a bath. And that's what we did. This was, the, this was just the cheap public bus from Istanbul to Tehran in Iran, and he was the bus driver, and it turned into an epic. It turned into a, an adventure, and that was just a, a third of the way to Kathmandu, and it was just, you know, we had pretty, pretty uh, humble accommodations. I remember I complained about the uh, sheet, like there was somebody's hairs on it. It's like they didn't, you know, clean the bedding uh, between me and the guy before me, and the guy came up, he apologized, and he turned the sheet over, and he said, maybe that's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, we met, but the good thing is we met all these it was eye-opening every day but we met all these very sweet people uh they were very strange but uh you know we we kept going on and and finally uh i remember this photo was taken right on the wasn't this the border at, at india yeah between pakistan and india and after all of the arid traveling through turkey iran afghanistan it was arab and muslim and then we got to the border of India and it was lush and it just felt uh, fertile and it was Hindu and some, I, I'd never been there at all, but I felt like I was coming home. It was the most beautiful experience. And to this day, I consider India my favorite country to travel in. Yeah, I think this photo captures the sort of the backdoor spirit that we were trying to keep up, even through all the hardship, even through the dysentery and the runs and everything, we, we were in it together and you had to be to and, get to the end. And Gene, notice how much lighter we're packing here than on our trip five years before that. Yeah, and it, it's not just because it all got stolen either. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we had to go light. We and we went local. Tried our best to fit in. We were the we we're the big news in a village who'd never seen somebody from the United States probably. We'd find a village like that. And what are you gonna do? There's no museum. Well, let's get a shave. Yeah, and suddenly the sightseer becomes the sight. I like it. But it was hard and it was every day was a little bit strange. We as we plunged into I India. Oh, man, this is my foot. And you see that you, you see that wound there. Remember, <laughs> I, this, I was, sure this was the wound that was left from the leech that grabbed onto me when you and I were wading across a tropical creek. Remember we that? Saw, we saw that leech coming at us, man. It was scary. <laughs> and uh, we, we on our tight budget, we could. Um, well, we had quite an education because even on our little um, street urchin budget, we could live quite well in India, like in this houseboat up in Kashmir. Yeah, there was actually a lot of good times on this trip uh, here on the houseboat. Remember when we were in, oh yeah, and here's a couple of very culturally sensitive travelers. <laughs> Taj Mahal, we were there. <laughs> we were there and we were just the same kind of small town goofs that... Uh, 
Yeah. That, yeah, we didn't know. And you know what this this photo reminds me of is when we were in Kathmandu. Remember we went to that place called Pie and Chai? Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm talking about? Yeah. That yeah. kind of hippie cafe yeah. where people could smoke hash. They'd play the Rolling Stones on the, on the uh, stereo system. And then everybody could eat apple pie, homemade apple pie. And you're just going, man, this is paradise here. Hippie and paradise. This, this is the first time I ever got high on marijuana. And uh, I, I swear, one reason why I'm so enthusiastic about legalizing marijuana is because just between you and me, I don't think I've ever, it's gotta be one of the happiest days of my life, pie and chai in Kathmandu, listening to classic rock, eating, eating apple pie coming out of a Nepali pizza oven, uh, you know, uh, smoking pot with cool travelers from around the world. <laughs> and we, you were, got monkeys. we were in hippie heaven, that's for it sure. It was it was hippie heaven, monkeys yeah. swinging from the trees. And uh, <laughs> no, and, and we didn't wear watches. We took our watches off. There was never anything timed, you know. So it was, uh, we'd stay in a Maharaja's palace and we'd had our rickshaw guy just waiting for us. It was like yeah, almost- I remember, annoying. actually, I found that kind of uncomfortable because you know, we're Americans and we're really into this egalitarian sort of thing. And it it bothered me when servants would be hovering over you, waiting to just pour a little milk. Sir, do you want some milk on your cornflakes? And I'm like, no, I can do it myself. And please <laughs> relax. And uh, we but, and that was another cultural adjustment that we had to make. It was, I remember it was like monsoon time. So it was like constantly torrential rain. And we were sitting there in this dilapidated palace with the white tablecloth two of us at a giant table having breakfast with five servants standing around waiting to pour milk for us and you and i were we were just vagabonds it was it was absurd and it sort of stuck with us that there is an absurd you know economic problem in the world and there's a lot of people to meet and a lot of experiences to have every day was a different experience i mean we didn't have any guidebook so we get up and we just go, well, we've heard about uh, go, taking, you can take these horses up the mountain. And so yeah. we would take horses up the mountain and in the middle of nowhere, you'd run across a, a cabin like this, a little stone hut, completely off the grid, nobody, no electricity. They, yeah. they, they heated themselves with a fire in the middle of the, the hut with a, with a hole in the roof to, to let the smoke out. I, what, really, I, what really struck me about this, though, is that you get that sense when you're there that they live totally different lives technology wise, but really deep down, we're very much the same. Yeah, they, they I, I seem to remember they didn't know how to shake hands. I put out my hand and it was like, what? What are you doing? Yeah. And, and they were they were curious in us. We were curious with them. It was just very cool to come together. But we had to get on a horse and, and go off the grid quite a ways to find that. I remember, Gene, learning about Sikhs. We went to the Jerusalem of the Sikh people, uh, Amritsar in uh, Punjab, and we went yes. to their golden temple. And I was so enamored with a different religion. It was just fascinating to me to, to, to branch out and realize different people find different truths. And I loved it. Yeah, and if 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 when we talk about this, we sound kind of like rubes or something. You got to remember back then, it really was a different time. The world wasn't globalized. Right. People didn't have a global perspective back then, and mm -hmm. we were just very typical of that. And yeah. we had to learn through hard experience of, about this wider world around us. So here we are in the Ganges, and this is the holiest place for Hindus. And we uh, we'd book a we'd just hire a boat, and uh, the tourists would go down the river and and watch people uh, in their rituals. And uh, uh, we'd we'd encounter people that just seemed like they were from far away. And you know, in in some ways, I'd studied religion in college, and in some ways, this trip started to become. I think I became kind of a pilgrim, looking for something. Uh, and this, and I know you write about travel as a spiritual act. Mm -hmm. And I, and on this trip, there were, there were times when I think we were, you know, gazing off into the distance. And, and by the end of the trip, I was looking to the future and kind of going, what, what is, what are we going to do next? Wow. And so by the time we came trucking home, it was, we were, we were very different people. 
And then we arrive home and once again, we're just supposed to be, we're adults. By then we're out of college, you're 22, 23. We're supposed to go out and get real jobs. Did we? No, <laughs> neither one of us went a conventional <laughs> path. I remember I, I kind of took the path of, of go, becoming a, a sort of bohemian artist. And you, you went a very unconventional path yourself. Well, I was a piano teacher and I, I, I just thought I want to be a piano teacher all my life. And I enjoyed that so much. My dad, of course, imported pianos from Europe. That's why I went to Europe for the very first time. And right here in Little Edmonds, we, my dad had his piano shop and I had my piano teaching studio, Steve's Studios. And these amazing grand, shiny grand pianos would be coming in from Germany. And uh, my dad sold the best pianos in, in the state right there. And I got to be a piano teacher. So I was a little businessman. I, I rented this building and I had my students and I had another teacher in the back and uh, <laughs> we'd have our recitals. And then I found that I started using my recital hall as a teaching hall. And I would fill it not with the parents of the piano students watching their darlings play their songs, but people that were going to Europe. And when you and I were going to India, Gene, we didn't have much information. And I gained a respect and a real ability to value information. And uh, I sort of found myself with a mission to help people travel better. And I had used my piano studio there for that purpose. And eventually I let my students go and I really focused on exactly what this is all about. Using Europe as a springboard for world travel, having a philosophy where if you see few, four cute guys sitting on a bench, ask them to scoot over, uh, you join them, you know, become a temporary local. You got to save money, so you got to have things that are very cheap, and <laughs> you got to have budget tricks. I mean, I, I got to admit, I was very perplexed by how much perfectly good food was being thrown away, and I won't tell you how how low I got, but we did some pretty low things to survive on our budget, and I was writing and writing and writing. Everywhere I went, I was taking notes, and I went back, and this was 1978, and I was teaching a class right there at the UW in the Experimental College, European Travel Cheap. It says, you know, England is, has been turned into a face and it says, feel my fjords, caress my castles. And we were teaching people to get on the road and uh, gave my lectures uh, to the paper and uh, self-published uh, my first book, uh, Europe Through the Europe Back through Door. Through the Back Door. There it is. That's what started it all. And it's in its 40th edition this year. And there was a whole nother dimension of our teaching, which I'm so thankful you and I were collaborators. Oh, yeah. This this uh, picture reminds me, you know, having traveled, we came home with a little bit more of a global perspective. And in the mid 80s, and this is Gorbachev here, things were changing all over the world. The, the, the Iron Curtain was coming down and and we kind of uh, got got taken in up by that idea that we all live on one world and we've got to care for it and our future is in our hands. And we started publishing this little homemade self-published newsletter that sort of merged travel with uh, politics and ecological issues. And it's interesting that um, I was, um, I had to make money. I was running a business and employing people. And at the same time, I wanted to capitalize on how travel broadens our perspective. So every other edition, one would be travel and the other would be politics. And this is way back when nobody knew who I was. Uh, I didn't have a TV show. My guidebooks were, were very small at that time. And we had this sassy attitude. I mean, here we have this giveaway magazine. We would stand down there at the opera house before the world cavalcade of travel in the street, giving people our magazines before they go into the travel show. People thought we were moonies pushing some religion, but our religion was getting out there and getting to know the world. And the Future in Our Hands magazine, here you see circulation 6,000 uh, editors, you, me, and our Indian friend, Bhaskar. Uh, the graphics were by our favorite uh, artist. Anonymous botch, I love it. <laughs> Copyright. We, we didn't. didn't. No rights are reserved. Anyone caught reprinting any material herein for any purpose whatsoever will be thanked profusely. And you know, Rick, I think that's very much the backdoor motto that carried from the beginning to the end. We were travelers. And as a traveler, you learn that whenever you get a certain, you go down the path. And mm -hmm. when you get a little certain experience, if there's anybody following on you on, on the path, it's your obligation to share that experience with them. 
And if you're sort of paying it forward so that you're making travel be easier for everybody and part of this, this travel club. Gene, I remember that. I mean, it's so interesting to say that. I've never heard you say that before, but remember when we were on the bus for 10 days going from Istanbul to uh, Nepal, it was different public buses, but half of the people on the bus were vagabonds and there was not much information and it was scary. You didn't know what kind of currency you were gonna get when you're changing. Was it, was it last year's currency that no longer had any value? You know, you didn't know what the what the traps that the police were gonna set you so they'd have to you'd have to bribe your way out of jail. There was it was scary. And everybody was sharing information and wishing there was more information. Today we have a glut of information. But back then you were frustrated with somebody who had been there before you that wasn't thoughtful enough to share with you because you were gonna experience what that person had already experienced. And consequently, we would turn around and, like you said, share with the people behind us. So we took it on ourselves to sort of become writers, even though we didn't have any real tri tri uh, you know, practice at it, and to become publishers, even though we weren't publishers. And, and we decided we were going to share knowledge of travel and of history and art, Europe's history and art, for people that, that, and make it more understandable and easy. And this was yeah, our this was the first this, edition and you I can love just see book. that it's a lot it's it's not your typical encyclopedia like a uh, guide to European history. Sure, Napoleon said, I conquered Europe with no understanding of its history and art, but it took me 10 years and 600,000 men. Caesar, ha, ha, ha. Caesar <laughs> friends, tourists, countrymen lend me 895 plus tax. And <laughs> you and I had this idea about keeping the history and the art fun. And one of our favorite characters was uh, Professor Stuffy Balding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this book is a disgrace. I'm shocked and appalled that anyone could make history and art so practical and easy to understand. History should hurt. With Europe 101, anyone can enjoy history, art, and culture. Oh my goodness. So And that's we what we did with Europe 101. Then shortly afterwards, we followed it up with another book on art, uh, Self-Guided Tours of Europe's Top Museums. Once again, the motto was, we don't want, we want people to come out of the experience enlightened and invigorated and not feeling like a victim of the Louvre. Boy, oh boy. And if you don't have information to help sort through all those superlatives and help you appreciate and understand what you're looking at, you can be the victim of these great galleries and all this ponderous art and history. You know, at this point, the big thing that we, that uh, that the Rick Steves company was going to start doing is what has become sort of our bread and butter since then, and that is bus tours. But I remember you were very reluctant to even start it because our whole ethos was was independent travel, and the right. last thing we wanted was a bus tour. But we tried to find the best of both worlds: the efficiency of bus travel with the fun and spontaneity of independent travel. And you started it off by being a guinea pig. That, you know, and I didn't have the money to go to Europe every year, but I did. And uh, I had to um, scam some kind of flight over. And uh, what I would do is I'd get 15 people to join me on a big bus, a 50 person bus tour. I would take that little group and I would get a free flight and I would get a free tour and then I could stay over and travel on on a piano teacher's income. But I went on these mass tourism, 50 seat, people on a 50 seat bus with my little groups from Seattle. And I learned on that experience what I do like about organized travel and what I don't like about organized travel. I learned that there were dear people that had scrimped and saved for this trip, clipping newspaper articles for, for years and finally they get their retirement trip and it's just boring. And then I learned that with a little, uh, a better ethic as a tour guide, you could make Europe fun and independent and still capitalize on the efficiency and the economy of organized travel. So I wanted to take bland travel and I wanted to turn it into back door travel. That's what we called it. We called it Europe through the back door. And my whole idea was to, we, we tried to be a part of the party, not part of the economy. 
here we are enjoying a front row seat, sitting on the front stump, dancing and drinking and eating with, with new Greek friends. We're a guest of honor at a Greek wedding festival. And we could do that with our little groups. It was experiential. If we wanted to ride on the rooftop and, and, and bite the wind under the, under the, the, the forests that provided the, the timber for the ships that made Britannia rule the waves, we could do that. And at first I was just gathering eight people and we would share the ride on the bus. It was like a, a commune because none of us had any money and I was just driving and organizing it and getting a, basically a free trip and everybody else was spending two or 300 bucks to join me. Uh, at first it was just women <laughs> and I, I, you know, I charged guys more. I mean, what, what can I say? Uh, but uh, we, uh, I did the driving and I did the teaching and I, I realized, you know, this is not sustainable. It was not a good thing, but it was a great way to start a tour program. It was really Europe through the gutter back then. It was experiential. We'd climb to the mountaintop. We'd sleep in in circus tents uh, with just a mattress and a blanket and uh, free tea in the morning. <laughs> 400 roommates kind of a cross between Woodstock and a slumber party. And that was our our big our rustic, you know, experiential beginnings of a tour program that eventually became professional. And now we take 30,000 people a year uh, uh, in a decent way with that same magic of uh, the travel experience we want to share. And that's kind of where I came into the tour program. By the way, could you, Rick, could you back it up to you in that youth hostel there? I yeah. just love this shot. I think you should call this our Lord of the Crowded Youth Hostel, <laughs> something like that. I wish okay, I could, let's continue. I guess I could, I wish I could re recreate. That was the circus tent in Munich and it was <laughs> filled with crazy travelers. And I was the only tour guide that would drive. We had no reservation. We'd, we'd spend the evening at the beer hall and then we'd get in the bus. I didn't know where the circus tent was, but I had been there as an independent traveler. And it was the end of trolley number 16. So I would literally follow the, tra the tracks of the trolley to the end. And there was the circus tent. And they'd give us our mattresses. And they'd look at me like, you're a tour guide? Taking your people to this? And, you know, I, I had to calm people down. <laughs> but it was a great experience. Okay. So now and it was we, experiences we, like that that I think created the great demand. And now people wanted to take it. And you needed to take these tours to the next level. So you hired this uh, Belgian bus company with these professional drivers and professional buses. Although I'll admit, the first tours, there was no air conditioning on the buses. Um, so we kept people hydrated, I remember, by pouring a lot of juice and giving them that, walking down the aisles, pouring juice into disposable cups and giving people so they wouldn't get heat stroke. We would drive These early the, tours, they, the were, they were difficult. These drivers were used to the same kinds of tours that you were doing with Cosmos back then. You know, they were used to very strict itineraries and everything. And then suddenly they get on these tours and the guide wants to be, hey, Jan, can we drive down this street right here? You know, this narrow lane, it'll get us closer to the Coliseum. And you could just see him kind of start sweating. But, you know, these drivers would show up on the first day in a suit and tie, but they'd very quickly learn this is a different kind of, of tour. And they ended up loving our kinds of tours. In fact, they loved our kinds of travelers too. This is Jan, right? And he was famous on our groups as a debonair, a great dancer, just a beautiful gentleman. And I'll never forget, he was just always a hit with the ladies. Uh, one statuesque blonde tourist fell in love with him, Colleen, right? Do you remember that? And uh, yes. it was like, it was the most romantic, uh, it was a very romantic thing. I remember just observing these uh, relationship things from a distance because I'm not, I'm not very uh, insightful about all of that as a tour guide. But Colleen, I remember, she went home, got a divorce, sold everything, moved to Belgium, learned to speak Belgian or Dutch, and lived happily ever after with Jan. It was the most romantic little story and it, it was just intense living that we were sharing on that bus with our Belgian bus drivers and our European friends. It was a very different kind of thing. And when you use the word romance, it wasn't just love. It was kind of romance with a capital R. Everything, all the colors were brighter. Things were always more exciting. And but they were also kind of, kind of and, and some of the standard features of these tours were starting to take shape, like the, the, the quaint locales, Cinque Terre place that no other bus tour would go. But we found a way to be able to park at a city farther away. 
ride the bus to the, the town that we, or take the train to the town that we wanted to do and enjoy it with very few other locals. And in many cases, we'd have to split the group up with different humble B&Bs and guest houses, but we had those magical experiences and we got together and, and had fun. We straightened up the Leaning Tower of Pisa, all 16 of us. And you know how we got to see this? Rick, do you remember this phrase, precision dump? That's right. Remember how we, we, we had this thing called a precision dump where the bus would just pull over to the side of the road and everybody would get off the bus as quickly as possible. And then the bus could take off without actually having to pay parking fees. And that's how we could do a gorilla hit on something like the, P the Leaning Tower of Pisa, hit it, sightsee for two hours and then take off. The you know, the bus driver, dump. The, the bus driver would, would say, can you stop right at the Leaning Tower? And he says, no, you can't do that. And we say, if we can all get off the bus in one minute, yeah. can you do it? And he said, well, nobody can get off the bus in one minute. And, and, and we said, well, you just watch us. And yeah. we trained our groups to get off the bus in less than a minute, all 18 or whatever of us. And we did these precision dumps and it saved us from a lot of wasted time walking a long way to get to those sites. We stayed in accommodations that no tour would inflict on their people. <laughs> <laughs> it was dormitories. It was places with curfews. <laughs> Bunk beds at times, six, eight, ten in a room. We did people's laundry just because I didn't want 20 people looking around for a laundromat. Put it on my bed. We'll put it in a big plastic bag and one of us will go do the laundry charge so everybody else can have a good time without the burden of doing their laundry. And you know, and you know, you can really start bonding with your fellow travelers <laughs> after you've seen their underwear. That's <laughs> and the, the unclaimed underwear would be on the bus in the morning, and we go, Whose is this? Yeah. <laughs> but by now, the, the, the tour was the, the elements of the tour were starting to form. And one of the crucial things was teaching. This is me, believe it or not. Look how young I was. Yeah. But the great thing, we weren't even licensed guides. No. But what I remember is that even these big museums like the Uffizi here or the Louvre, they would let us guide. And I think the reason they did is because they looked at our groups and they went, these people are engaged. They're interested. Why should we hassle with them? And, and we were allowed to, to guide when other people weren't. Oh, and Gene, you, you, you set the bar for guides on, on art and, and history teaching on the streets and in the museums. And isn't it gratifying to have 20 people that are steep on the learning curve and curious and, and right there, and they, they value the travel opportunity and the experience and to be able to give them that understanding in that context. And you used to do that in, in situ. I remember you'd, you'd do that, like especially in Rome, right? Oh, just give me a bunch of rubble to sit my group on and let me talk about the rise and fall. I mean, it's kind of boring uh, uh, from a distance, but when you're right there, suddenly you, you can, you can resurrect, we used to call it resurrecting the rubble. And I, before I, I remember this, look at, I'm pretty excited right here because I'm going to take a group into a Gothic cathedral. And these are smart Americans who have never been instructed on what is the difference between Gothic and Romanesque. They've never been in a Gothic cathedral. I'm explaining the value of a pointed arch, Gothic style, instead of a round arch, Romanesque style. And you do that by building a Gothic cathedral out of tourists. And people have heard me talk about this before because I just think this is such a classic way to demonstrate how you can teach art in a way that's fun and meaningful. And our yeah. groups loved it. You, all, you take volunteers, you need six columns, six buttresses. You have the support of the buttresses flying in with flying art, with flying buttresses, those arches, and then one mighty spire hoisting yourself up. And there you got the structural essence of Gothic. And you step into a Gothic cathedral or a Gothic church and you see it, you see the columns, you see the buttresses, you see the, the ribs, and you see the wonder of the triumph, I think, of the high Middle Ages. And another feature was picnics. And you think, oh, it's just practical, it's just cheap, you're doing it. But I love doing picnics. You'd shop for a picnic by literally just walking up Main Street. The guides would go up and you'd buy the, your meats from the butcher and your bread from the baker. Then you'd schlep all of this food to a really exotic location and offer this pop-up picnic to your group as they arrived and have this wonderful feast with a wonderful backdrop, whether it's castles or a beautiful lake or, uh, or, or somewhere, a monument in Italy. 
Gene, this is me with Steve Smith, a good friend of ours yeah. that's always been guiding with us for a long time. Hard to recognize all of us 30, 40 years ago. Um, and uh, we made a teaching opportunity out of it, a teaching moment out of it, because what you were eating was part of the culture. So that was the art and the fun of having a picnic. It saved time, it saved money, it was nutritious, and it was a genuine slice of the local culture. And we'd wash it down with not fine wine, but good local Chianti filled up like in a in a filling station and that's what the locals were doing and that's what we would do but what we really really appreciated was being able to find these kind of discoveries these places that had no tourism and we had groups hardy enough to walk up there and experience that and groups that celebrated our, our one of our slogans was if it's not to your liking change your liking you know and another slogan was it's never too late to have a happy childhood and we had this sort of wonderful esprit de corps on the groups that knew that you had to earn those experiences. And, and, and we, we made a point to help people understand, to bring history to life. I mean, if, it had to, if you had to use one of your tour members as a human battering ram to teach the feudal, feudal age and, uh, and all the petty warfare in the Middle Ages, so be it. The tours were great fun. That's what I remember. And because they were so fun, suddenly demand started to grow which meant that there needed to be an office to support it. More and more, <laughs> Rick Steves, the, the scruffy traveler, became Rick Steves, the businessman. And you, Rick, you are a good businessman. I'll say <laughs> that. Don't ever play the board game Risk with Rick because <laughs> he dominates the world. Trust me on that. All right. Well, we Because had the, the business had to grow, the office moved across the street to the building where it's at now, the main office now, that had more space. Um, it was pretty basic, you know, this was back before, you know, scotch tape and paper clips, not much of an office. Then we get a little higher technology as the, as the build, uh, business grows. The center of the office all the time was the resource center, the place where there was information. Again, this idea, that travelers pass the information on to other travelers. And that was sort of the core, a place where people could come, pull a book off the shelf and plan their tour. You know, Gene, one of my dreams when I was a kid just starting off was having this library, because I had a lot of books from my travels because I was just crazy about travel books and so on. And I thought other people should be able to use this. And my dream was to have a, a fire on, an overstuffed chair, a photocopy machine you could use for free, and a chance for people to come and let their travel dreams percolate and, and, and help them out. And that's what we have to this day at our travel center here in Edmonds. And uh, it's just, I'm so thankful we got uh, a staff that loves, that is mission driven, just like you and I are. Yeah, the, I think that was the best part about it is it was the, the people that you work with. Uh, I remember it was always kind of three musketeers, all for one, one for all. Everybody was willing to schlep boxes if you needed to, or do a slideshow if you needed to. And slowly and slowly, the staff would grow. The thing is, we were all travelers, and most of us were tour guides. I remember the, the office itself in summertime used to become a ghost town because we were all over in Europe traveling and leading tours. Yeah, that, We I loved think... to travel. We loved to have fun. And the parties, of course. This is the only surviving photo of these legendary parties that we used to have back then. In fact, I believe this one might be the, the notorious hot tub party. <laughs> oh my. Too. But we oh were my. always willing to, to we, we, we worked hard and we played hard. Then we went back to Europe and we started to, and we continued leading tours. The tour itinerary was getting set from Amsterdam down to Italy and back up with nice stops in, in the Alps at places like Walter's, uh, Walter's Chalet in the middle of the Alps. And mm. this was the very, the accommodations you can see, there was 10 people in, in the loft at Walter's place. And as you can see, people loved it. It became a, it was, it was a pajama party. Yeah, Instead you know, we, we'd have 24 people, we'd have 20 people, 24 people in a group maybe, and he had eight rooms, so that's 16. That means eight people don't get a room, they're up in the loft. And uh, that was just understood when you took a Rick Steves tour in the old days that you might have a shower down the hall, you, prob you might have to sleep in the loft. Uh, and uh, it, it was a fun sort of uh, uh, heritage that we have that uh, we've built our program on today where now people expect and people get 
you know, all of what you'd expect in a hotel for a modern group. Yeah. Great restaurants. Great restaurant owners. When, when you do the, the number people. of tours, you started to meet the same people. And then, and it was always one of the standard features was the tour reunion started very small and then they became quite big like this where people would come and meet up with the the people they took a tour with the previous summer and you know and by now it was like you'd you'd laugh you'd, you'd laugh about the crummy hotel that you were in you would you'd laugh about when the bus <laughs> broke down it became a great travel story that you could share for the rest of your life with these friends that you'd made on the on your trip and it's you know it's we i i there was a it, we kind of morphed to a point where we could actually fly our guides in and even fly our bus drivers in from Europe to gather for this massing of the scrapbooks and this joyful reunion. And it was a cultural festival. It was a way to, to for the groups to get back together and, and rekindle those memories. And it was also a way to sell tours. So uh, but this goes right back, Gene, to our that's the gym that you and I uh, climbed the rope on and did the pegboard and did wrestling and were snapped with the towel by our gym coat uh, <laughs> back in the 1960s when we were in junior high school. Uh, yeah, that's the gym. Do you remember that? It's haunted. I did not notice that. Wow. That's the gym of Edmonds Junior High School. Yeah. We had so many cool people that were part of our tour program. What's your memories of Senior Ceriso uh, in Vernazza on the Cinque Terre? Ceriso summed up the, the easygoing lifestyle of the Cinque Terre there. When you'd say, oh, Senior Ceriso, can, can we get uh, breakfast uh, a half hour early tomorrow? And he'd go, oh, Gino, he's big problem for me. But for you, I do it. And that was kind of the attitude that we, that we wanted up through for all of our hotel owners. He called you Gino. Gino. Oh, Gino, he's big problem. <laughs> Senior Sorriso. We were, yeah. He was the only hotel in town and we, we booked him out for half of the summer and he was part of the family. Oh man. We learned that, uh, as I said, you know, it's, it's never too late to have a happy childhood and age only matters if you're a cheese. And we learned how to not act our age. We'd take people uh, uh, down the mountain on these luge carts and we'd tell them, hang on to that stick. If you, if you just let go of that stick and wave at your partner when she's taking a picture, you're gonna slow yourself down by rubbing your elbow on the track. And we've got the scabs huh. in our history to prove it. <laughs> That's kind of a metaphor for, our, for those early tours that were, you know, uh, they're very exciting, but a little bit reckless. And we wouldn't do it today. Okay, it's okay. We wouldn't do it today. We're taking if, if 30, you did it today, people. you'd you'd yeah, you'd probably got, be 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 fired or incarcerated. We've got <laughs> there's so many reasons you wouldn't do it today. I'm glad we did it when we did, but we couldn't get away with it today, uh, and probably thankfully so. <laughs> but the great thing with these be early best of Europe tours, you could go hiking in the morning. You could see a museum in the afternoon. And then at night, you'd spend the evening chicken dancing the night away and <laughs> then go drop into bed and wake up the next day refreshed and ready to do it all again. My goodness. <laughs> you know, Rick, when, the thing that when I look at that is that the, those early tours and everything that we did, there was a certain element of spontaneity. And that where you dare to go down a certain path and just see what was there. And I think that also applied to many of the side projects that you and I were always doing along the way. I remember, mm -hmm. for example, first off, you know, you did postcards from Europe. You know, this, this wasn't a pragmatic uh, guidebook. You were trying to capture with, with, with colorful writing, capture that romance of the backdoor destinations. I, I went off on the path of uh, pursuing music and art and theater, stand-up comedy. Um, and I can't say it was quite the right path, but it's like everything that you do. You know, you go, you go off in a, in a certain direction. You know, one of the things that I did, yeah, go to that next slide there. You know, I, I'd gone on this 22 day as a tour guide doing the 22 day best of Europe trip. And I turned it into a suite of songs, Europe in 22 minutes, with music that starts in Amsterdam and takes you down to Venice and Venice, vain woman, you need the night and so on and ends in Paris. 
Um, oh, you know, I now love, that I, gotta... I think about it, some of this stuff was a little bit crazy, but it was the same kind of crazy stuff that we would that uh, you and I were always doing. You know, you Gene, did uh, you did your own. Uh, before we leave your music, I I just you know me and your music. I I just think one of the sad realities is everybody doesn't get a chance to hear your, your music. It is your music was so inspired and beautiful and fun, and I just well that's because uh, that's because no one owns a cassette tape player anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you. It was so beautiful. And then we see, we had our this is the same thing we were doing back before computers when we had the Future in Our Hands Club meeting the first Sunday of every month. Now we have Monday night travel. I mean, we were doing this in the piano studio, uh, having the World Traveler Slide Club on the first Sunday and the Future in Our Hands Club on the third Sunday. And then now we can write a book and we can make TV shows and we can have Monday night travel. But it's the same philosophy, isn't it? It's the love of travel and the value of travel woven together in a very accessible way. Yeah, and when, and when for my next project, what did I do? Oh, yeah, that's right. You and I did this. Uh, well, for my next project, um, I, I wrote an opera. You know, I'll say that again because people go, what? What the heck? <laughs> I wrote an opera. What a crazy idea. But I, I've i been thinking about it. And I wonder if the seed was planted 50 years ago when you and I in 1973 on our backpacking trip saw our very first opera in Rome. At the Baths of Caracalla, we saw the opera Aida mm -hmm. when they, they brought they brought elephants on the stage for crying out loud. What an impression to make on a young mind. And I wonder if that's what kind of planted the seed that put me down a path where suddenly I said, I'm going to write my own opera. Gene, we were strange teenagers. I mean, <laughs> we liked to party, you know, and uh, eventually we did uh, a lot of fun stuff that uh, wasn't what your, you know, what, what your ideal parental kind of a vision might be. But we went to the opera in Baths of Caracalla when we were 17 and 18. We didn't have a lot of money. It was a big investment. And we didn't just go once. <laughs> We went night after night, if I remember correctly, and uh, we'd sit on the bluff overlooking the forum and, and talk about Gibbon, right, and the rise and fall. And when the forum was called the, the cow field, when it was half covered, we had this romantic appreciation of history and music and culture. And we certainly didn't get it from playing baseball in the sandlot. We yeah. got it because we scraped together our, 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 a few dollars and we got to go to Europe. I'm so I know it brought you to doing your the symphonic journey that yeah. you did. Just a love of classical music. And suddenly you're one of the caretakers of this European art form of classical music. In fact, I'll be, I'll be performing this with the Naples Symphony Orchestra in Florida this weekend. I'm flying down there. And, and this is a symphony that I, that I host all over the United States, celebrating romantic anthems from the late 19th century that uh, let us feel the passion that each culture has for its own story. Just like we love our music, our, our John Philip Sousa and our America the Beautiful and our Aaron Copeland, every country's got that. But these are these little bees in your bonnet you get when you travel because you're thinking and you're collecting these ideas and you've got the nerve to travel down that road even if you don't know for sure where it's gonna take you whether it's uh, on a trip or if it's a metaphorical road. And finally, where our trip took us in collaboration was our most recent really big collaboration. And that is this TV series that combines travel and art and history into a six hour program called The Art of Europe. That was a big project that you and I did. And in some ways, I think it was a, a culmination of this whole backdoor journey that started way back in 1973. And we waited, we, 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 we worked for two years on this 90 page script. You essentially wrote it and it was just a, a monumental task. A lot like uh, we're gonna talk about the tomb of Julius II in a minute. It was huge. And uh, let me just uh, give, I'd like, we're gonna talk about your new book, uh, Michelangelo at Midlife. But what I'd like to do first to warm up on that is take just four or five minutes from the six hour art series we did, Gene. And let's just share that with our viewers right now. I'm gonna um, share the uh, screen and I'm gonna go to ricksteves.com 
like I like to do because all of our TV shows and all of our Monday night travels and all of our writing is available right here. I'm going to go into Classroom Europe. I'm going to click on that. And then this is 600 little video clips and more than 100 of them are from our six hour art series. And in the search bar, I'm just going to type in Mike and I get everything that has Michelangelo. And here is the six minute module from our six hour art series. And I'm just going to, by the year 15, let's see, I'm going to um, shorten it a little bit to save time, but we're going to, um, we're going to just get a little context of Michelangelo as you and I taught in this series that's airing all over the United States on public television and people can watch all six hours of it anytime they want if they just go to our website. Here we go. Michelangelo is his own. As a multi-talented Renaissance man, Michelangelo made his mark as a world-class sculptor, painter, and architect. As an architect, he designed and created this memorial chapel for his patrons, the Medici, a harmonious ensemble of innovative architecture, tombs, and sculpture. As a sculptor, Michelangelo believed his figures were already divinely created within the stone. He was simply chiseling away the excess. These rough and unfinished statues seem to be struggling like prisoners to free themselves from the marble. They show the Renaissance love of the body as with his chisel, Michelangelo reveals these compelling figures. Barely 25 years old, Michelangelo established his genius by sculpting this Pietà, adored by centuries of pilgrims. With powerful realism, Michelangelo made it clear to the faithful, Jesus is dead. The theological point of this work, he gave his life for our salvation. Mary's crumpled robe accentuates Christ's smooth body, helping make hard stone look soft as skin. Great art that delivers an emotional punch is no accident. That's its purpose, and it does so by design. Next, Michelangelo took on the epic scale statue of David, displayed today as if the high altar in a temple to humanism. The young shepherd who slew the giant turned down the armor of the day, arming himself only with stones. He throws his sling over his shoulder and goes out to face the giant. Michelangelo catches David at the exact moment when he's sizing up the enemy and thinks to himself, I can take this guy. This statue has come to symbolize that with the Renaissance, humankind could slay the giant of medieval ignorance and superstition. David's oversized right hand was no accident it represented how this shepherd boy, empowered by God, could slay the giant, and how Florence could rise above its rival city-states. When you look at David, you're looking at Renaissance man. Artists now made their point using realism. They did this by merging art and science. For instance, Michelangelo actually dissected human corpses to better understand anatomy. This humanism was not anti-religion. Now people realize that the best way to glorify God was not to bow down in church all day long, but to recognize their talents and to use them. Michelangelo established himself as Europe's greatest sculptor, and he was a pretty darn good painter as well. This holy family, Michelangelo's only surviving easel painting, offers a closer look at his mastery as a painter. The solid, statuesque people posed in a sculptural group show why many call Michelangelo a sculptor with a paintbrush. And the Greek-style nudes in the background are a reminder of the artist's humanist and classical orientation. He created perhaps his greatest work in the Pope's Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo depicted no less than the entire history of the Christian world, from the creation to the first people, and much later, to the final event in history, the awe-inspiring Last Judgment. Michelangelo painted God busy creating from every conceivable angle. 
and the centerpiece, the central act of creation. God passing the divine spark of life to his greatest masterpiece, you and me. Whoa, you and me. That's classic Gene Openshaw. <laughs> Gene, that nice. is, I love that. And, and there were a lines there that you gave me back in 1984 when we first uh, did that uh, Europe 101 book, you know, uh, David sussed up the giant and said, I can take this guy, you know. <laughs> nice work. Hey, Gene, um, since then, we have, um, well, as you said, we all have our latest creative adventures. It is so exciting that you've invested the time and the energy to write this book to share an amazing story that means a lot to you. Um, Michelangelo at Midlife. Set this book up for us, can you? Well, I, I will, but you know, before I get right into it, I kind of want to emphasize that Michelangelo at Midlife isn't just an art and history book. It's also a travel book that comes out of our experience. And I'll maybe get to that a little bit later. But the dust jacket blurb for, the, for Michelangelo at Midlife is this. It's the story of how Michelangelo, the great Michelangelo that we just saw in that clip there, who despite all his other accomplishments, struggled to, realize, to uh, finish and complete what was to be his magnum opus, the tomb of Pope Julius II. It went into delays and detours. It took him 40 years and it plunged him into what was essentially a 40 year long epic midlife crisis as he struggled to complete this. Yeah, good, good. Let's, sh let's show us a, a few slides because not only is the book a story, but it's also a story told visually. So let's take a look at some of the things found in the interior. The core of the story, of course, is Michelangelo's own life how he was the sculptor of David, the painter of the Sistine ceiling, the architect of St. Peter's, this great guy. But as he worked on the tomb, he also was a traveler. And it shows how he traveled all across Italy, from Florence, where he was born and began the tomb, to the mountains of Carrara, where he quarried the marble, off to Venice, where he would escape to get perspective on his troubled life. He goes down to uh, uh, Tuscany and Umbria, where he would, where he enjoyed the wine. By the way, by the way, <laughs> now that I think about it, I'm drinking an Orvieto Classico. Oh, nice. Made from the white Trebbiano grape, which was Michelangelo's favorite wine. A little, well, little side note there. I'm drinking a, 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 a vintage that Michelangelo probably had no idea existed. And, and who would probably still drink it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Michelangelo traveled all over and finally settled in Rome where the tomb was to be built. It's the story of the tomb from his grandiose in, initial youthful ideas for it and then how with delays and detours, it got his dream got dwindled over the years. It's the story of the evolution of the statues from naked pagan men to Christian women, from exuberant victories to agonized prisoners. It's really a psychological odyssey too, from Michelangelo's youthful optimism his flights of fancy and his love affairs. It's about how he uh, fell into deep depression and brooded in his midlife years and how he find, had to find the courage to, and the will to finish his tomb and hope to find some hard earned wisdom and epiphanies late in life. With that combination of elements Michelangelo at Midlife is a book that should appeal to lovers of travel, to lovers of history, lovers of art, and really to any serious, thoughtful reader. <laughs> All right. Hey, Gene, well, thanks for the um, introduction to your book. And um, I'll tell you- If I could I... add one more thing too, to this. Yeah. You know, this book is about Michelangelo 
But really, it's about a guy who travels across Europe uh, looking for the clues to the mystery of Michelangelo's tomb project. And anybody that knows me or knows you, it's, it's, it's not obvious, it would be obvious to them that this book clearly comes out of yours and my type of mm -hmm. search uh, for meaning as, as we've found through travel. And it's, it, it really is a very personal work for myself, from myself. And um, I hope that, that that resonates with the reader. I had an advantage in reading it because it was easy for me to see the autobiographical nature of this. And it really was uh, a, a fascinating read uh, on many levels. And I read it from cover to cover and loved it, Gene. Uh, congratulations on that. Um, you know, you can buy this book, or anybody can buy this book, uh, wherever you like to get your books. It retails for $28. Um, I bought a whole bunch of them. And just for Monday Night Travel, we'd like to sell them tonight for the next 24 hours only on our website for $10. You heard it right. It retails for 28 bucks. It's a deal at that. But if you'd like to get it, we'd love to get this into your hands just to celebrate Gene's uh, creativity to celebrate a collaboration that I'm really thankful for. I mean, you know, being creative can be lonely. It is such a blessing to have a, a partner in your travels and a partner in your collaborations. And uh, this is just a beautiful book. So Gene, congratulations on that. And if people want to get the book, I would remind you that there's a link in the chat section. You can go to ricksteves.com and just go into the shopping corner there, look in the books and you'll see it right there. Uh, nobody else knows about it unless unless they're watching Monday Night Travel. It's ten dollars just for the next day, Gene. And if you order by midnight, we'll send you <laughs> a set of steak knives. Oh, baby! No, we won't. no. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Hey, um, but we carry on now. We, you know, we went from the sort of hippie beginnings to uh, when it was called Europe through the back door. When the TV show came along, all of a sudden people are going, "Well, I like this." TV show by this guy named Rick Steves, but what's Europe through the back door? So the, the name of the company morphed from Europe through the back door to Rick Steves, Europe through the back door to Rick Steves Europe, which is what we call it now, from ETBD to RSE. And uh, it's really the TV show that in so many ways raises awareness of our love of Europe and uh, our teaching. Uh, we started doing the TV show back in the, I think back as far as 1990. Uh, I've been working with the same crew for, for ever since then. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be meeting Simon and Carl in, uh, in uh, Europe this uh, summer. We're going to shoot some wonderful new shows. I'm so thankful to have the, uh, the partners, the, the people to collaborate with, talented, mission-driven people that love travel and love the value of travel, whether they're co-authors like Gene, whether they are tour guides, uh, whether they are TV producers or cameramen. Of course, this is Simon Griffith, our producer, and Carl Bauer, our, our cameraman, Peter Rummel, another of our camera people. Uh, if you look at this, this is a long time. We're just improvising. Peter is holding on to a rope on that car, and I'm pedaling behind the car, giving my on camera, and, and we're rolling. And only later did I see a decal on the TV that says, kill your TV. <laughs> a decal on the car. Look at that. Kill your TV. Well, you're going to kill your cameraman if you drive too fast. So let's get that in the can. But we've got, uh, you know, we went from that first tour, the minibus tour that was just going around and around the best of Europe in 22 days to 40 different itineraries. Uh, I'm so thankful of, uh, for the success we've had because of our tour guides and because of our focus and because of our business practices and our ethic of teaching and maximum experience and now we're taking 30,000 people to Europe every year on 1,200 different tours, 40 itineraries. I've got 150 wonderful guides, most of them Europeans and over the years we've made some great friends. This is Hansa in Prague. Everywhere we go we have people that love our tourists because our tourists are, are curious, they're smart, they are thoughtful and they're gonna get the most out of this travel experience. Uh, our, our whole guidebook series e evolved from being handbooks to our tours. At, at, and the original uh, Europe in 22 Days book was the handbook for the tours, but it was designed so people could do our tours without us. For $3.50, you could buy the brains of the tour and do it on your own if you didn't want to, if you wanted to do the driving. We had a whole series of books that, that were the handbooks for our 22-day tours, and eventually those became the guidebooks that now are the best-selling guidebooks for every corner of European travel. The flagship of the, all of our 60 or 70 titles is Europe Through the Back Door, as I mentioned, out in its 40th edition now. 
Uh, Gene and I had so much fun back there injecting art and history into the books. This is our, our the first book Gene and I did together. It evolved over the ages. Hey, uh, oh hey, yeah, hey, Rick, could you back up? Yeah, to this one. Can you zoom in on David's David's bits? Zoom is that in possible. David, do, do, zoom in on David's. Um, yeah, can you see? Penis. Can the viewers? Can you see that kind of white patch there? Yes. Remember, this was the cover that had the infamous green fig leaf on David that you could peel on and off, and that's <laughs> the glue that held it on there. Remember that? I do, because this was the self-published book. And yeah. when we, I asked my publisher, would you want to publish this? And they said, we just cannot publish it with the full frontal nudity because it won't sell in the Midwest. It'll be upside down on the coffee table. And I said, they said, we need to put a fig leaf on it. I said, you can't put a fig leaf on Michelangelo's David. And he said, well, if you want to sell books, you do. And I said, how about if we have a peel off fig leaf? So depending on your neighborhood, you can leave it on or take it off. And they said, that's too expensive. It costs 10 cents for a fig leaf to put it on the book, to, to print it and the, the labor to put it on. And I said, how about if I pay half? And they said, okay. So we printed 10,000 books. That was $1,000 for fig leaves. And I'll never forget, I wrote a, a check, $500. And in the little line at the bottom, you say, what's it for? Fig leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so, a nickel well spent. <laughs> a nickel well spent. And then we, uh, <laughs> there's one with, with no penises there. A few <laughs> tradition. But uh, yeah, look at that. We don't, have any, uh, we, we don't have any problem like that with the latest edition of that book. Gene, I'm so uh, excited and thankful for the, new, the latest book that you and I have written, Europe's 100 Masterpieces. You and I got to choose our favorite masterpiece. That in itself was a, was a fun chore, just coming up with 100 masterpieces that we wanted to feature. And uh, just, you artfully wrote up those masterpieces. And both of us have had a lot of fun putting on that great reformer's hat and sharing people with the lessons we learn from our travels. Yeah, at this point, you and I were less tour guides and more writers and researchers for the books. That's kind of our, it shared, our lives kind of shifted. Yeah, and we would find these wonderful uh, opportunities to spend less money and experience more. You'd stay in a two-star hotel instead of a four-star hotel, and you'd get to know Francoise and Stefan, the family who ran it. We'd get to know great inspirational teachers all over Europe. Um, perhaps the most famous is Malcolm Miller, the, the, the charismatic, wonderful Scottish scholar that, that pretty much spent his whole career at uh, Chartres Cathedral uh, in, in France, teaching the wonders of Gothic. And oh, what a wonderful gentleman. And Gene, wasn't it, wasn't it sort of an honor to bring our groups to him over the years? Uh, and we'd type it up and uh and and you were you've been so busy uh, on the the art dimension yeah that was yeah that kind of became my beat as i became less of a tour guide they kind of put me out to stud and so i became more of a researcher and my beat was always the museums and the high art and your beat was a little different a little more uh I had to go to all of the stupid <laughs> Disney sites and uh, to see if they're worth $25 to sit on this train to go choo-choo through a Viking village in England. Or uh, I had to learn the lesson the hard way that you lock the bike frame to the rack, not the bike tire, because you'll come out in the morning and there's your tire locked to the frame. Every time I get ripped off, I celebrate because I'm going to learn that scam and pack it into the book. And, and that's part of the reason the books are so successful. I love to uh, see uh, food and, and wine and, and uh, the cuisine as, a, as another avenue into the, into the cultural soul of a people. I love to find uh, easy ways for, uh, for people to get their thrills in nature, like uh, going on a, a Via Ferrata in Switzerland. And both of us enjoy seeing young people, especially school groups, using our material over there and really perhaps having their perspective opened up just like our tours did when we were that age. It was all about taking our knowledge and passing it on to the end user, the next yep. to the next traveler down the line. And speaking of next travelers down the line, of course, you go through the years and uh, you have uh, wonderful families and you want to expose your kids to the, the wonders of travel. I'm so thankful to have been able to uh, travel with Andy and with Jackie. This is little Andy. Uh, <laughs> Andy didn't seem to be paying attention back when we would be uh, running around Europe as a little kid. And we went every year for 18 years until he was on his own. 
And today, Andy is a wonderful tour guide, and, and he's, uh, he's more comfortable out in the world, I think, in a lot of ways than I am. He's just, to me, an inspiration. And of course, Gene, you've got a lovely time with your daughter. I found it so rewarding to travel with my child, and the greatest thing about it was to be able to go to some of the very same places and stand on the very same street corners as you and I had done 50 years before, like um, at Rotenberg. I love it. You know, as the information age expanded, so did the company have to expand. You had to get a website, a new way to pass knowledge, pass knowledge through radio. Uh, mm -hmm. You and I took the, the tours of Mona Winks and turned them into audio tours. So people could pop in their earbuds and go traveling and experience uh, this great history and art as independent travelers. And one of our publicity stunts, Gene, has always been giving away a lot of information. Our TV shows are free, our radio shows are free, our app is free, the 60 tours you and I have put together. And, and you have you have spearheaded the whole uh, Rick Steves Audio Europe uh, app program. I'm just so excited about it and proud of the fact that tens of thousands of people have us in their ear every day at these great sites all around Europe. And as the company grew, so the staff grew, getting bigger and bigger. But the one thing that never changed was the parties. We always loved to get together and, and party. And, and I believe just after this picture was taken, then we all stripped naked and headed to the hot tub. Isn't that right? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Yeah. This, this was actually know, a happy yeah. day when we came out of COVID. This is the day we declared huh. we're going back to Europe after two years. Of, of just hunkering down and, and uh, making sure we got through together the challenges of that difficult time for anybody in travel. Rick, let's wrap this baby up. We've, Sounds gone, we've been together for half a century. And during that time, we've seen Europe change a lot. When we started traveling, half of Europe was behind the Iron Curtain. All countries had hard borders. Very few people spoke English. About the only uh, cultural language when you and I were traveling was pop music. You know, you'd get together with people up at the youth hostel and you'd go, uh, Beatles, magnifique, you know, and we'd all <laughs> cheer, you know, Led Zeppelin, wee oui, wee, oui, CC, and we'd all cheer. Back then, changing money was tough because every country had its own uh, currency with its own exchange rates. What a boon to travelers when suddenly there's ATMs and you can get local currency right out of a machine. That seemed miraculous at the time. And then of course the European Union formed, the borders came down, there was a common currency and it made travel so much easier. Think of all the tech changes that we've seen over the years. Rick, remember how hard it was just to make a single phone call? You needed to carry this pocket full of change and stuff it into there and then hope somebody answered on the other end. <laughs> it was. And when you had 25 people on a tour bus waiting for you as you're out there, <laughs> as you're out there in the in the field in a red phone booth, smells like urine. You're out of coins. You don't know if you have a place to sleep tonight with your group and the phone's not working. Yeah. Wow. But it's made so much easier as everybody gets their own personal device. And it may kind of be a little bit, make things a little more generic, but at least technology does power individual travelers. Europe now is laced together by these high-speed trains. You know, someone from London, someone from Paris, someone from Amsterdam, they can all catch a train and meet in Brussels for lunch and then find their way home for dinner. That's good. The I world thought you were has say changed enormously in 50 years. It's become much more globalized very different world than we were at but with all the changes some things stay the same there's still these same beautiful locales there's still the same beautiful timeless art that everybody can enjoy that we saw 50 years ago there's still the same wonderful people that you will meet there's still a uh, uh you can still take a tour uh, one of our tours Get on the bus, go uh, go to remote areas that you couldn't reach otherwise. Still have the same spontaneous type of experiences. You can go hiking, find your own religious epiphanies, and you can 
meet local owners, lo restaurant owners, and enjoy great food. And most of all, bond with fellow travelers where you can have that unique experience that you can share with them for the rest of their lives. Wow. Europe is still rooted in its traditions. Any given night, you can go to a pub and see that re those traditions being resurrected and brought to life again. So even after a half century, Europe is looking to the future with optimism. The backdoor spirit still blows free. And Rick, you and I are still trucking after all these years. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Keep on trucking, buddy. Hey, that was so fun, Gene. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, ha, what great memories. Thank you all for uh, following us. And let's go back to Lisa now. And I bet we have a few questions. We do indeed have many questions, although I think people were actually so intrigued by what you guys were saying that they were not as active in the Q&A as they normally are. But first, a word from our sponsor, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Lisa and Ben and Gabe and our Monday Night Travel staff. Uh, Gene and I get a lot of fun to do all of these books, but we couldn't do the books without our map makers and without our editors and without the people that work on our website. And we are a team of 100 people that we work as a beautifully crafted organism, and we are mission driven to equip and inspire our travelers to venture beyond Orlando. <laughs> and Gene and I are just thinking about that, how thankful we were that we got to go to Europe for summer camp when we were just teeny boppers. And it just put our lives on a different trajectory. Um, and for me, as a, a person who's been able to live my dream uh, as running a company like this with so many good people and so many fun people to collaborate with, it's, it's just been a real joy and a real blessing. And, um, you know, my, uh, my uh, uh, word from our sponsor right now is uh, to thank all our staff that helps make this possible. And uh, stay tuned because we got a lot of good travels coming up. Thank you. Okay. Um, there were several questions kind of around this, but can you extrapolate on your budget on those early uh, through the gutter days? Did you not budget correctly or were you robbed? Like, why were you so desperately poor? Oh, we had, we, we knew exactly how much money we had. We, we left home with $3 a day and we would, we, we knew we were going to be in Europe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jane, like for 70 days and every 10 days, we literally dump our money on the bed, count it up and divide it by how many days we had left. And we'd say, we're doing good or we're falling behind. We got to tighten up. We played a game where we would see how many hours we could go without spending a coin and we would go well over a day without spending a single penny. We probably spent a third of the nights for free. I've got the actual um, statistics because I was keeping a record and our average cost per night for 70 nights was 84 cents each. That's a dollar fifty for the twin room. Uh, it would have been two fifty really because a third of the nights were free. But uh, we would get on a train and go out for four hours, cross the track and go back for four hours just to use the train pass and not spend any money to sleep all night. <laughs> so the things we did, but we, we didn't we never got ripped off. We just started poor anyways, <laughs> and we finished the trip on an expired rail pass. We, we, we were going out to the airport in Frankfurt and there's like this suspense thing. You got a conductor at this end of the train, a conductor at this end of the train, two vagabonds right here. It's about eight minutes to the airport and they're coming closer. Yeah. And we're going, are we gonna get arrested or are we gonna go to the airport and fly home? And just right there, we got to the airport, we hopped out and we, we, got, we went home with, 50 cents in our pockets. It was a triumph from a budget point of view. <laughs> but I, I was chronically malnourished. I was actually sick for my first month of school. And I went to the doctor and he just said, what have you been eating? And I said, bread, jam, and Fanta. <laughs> that was it. I learned to drink coffee because it was free, but it didn't have many dollars. <laughs> I'm glad you survived. Um, so then... oh, wait a minute. Gene, do you remember the last uh, days of our trip the apples were ripe in the orchard oh, at rodenberg we had in rodenberg fruit we, we had... walked through the valley and we were we were like in heaven because we actually had fresh fruit we pick them <laughs> off the trees and run from the farmer with his buckshot <laughs> after us <laughs> okay lisa <laughs> um 
I just am just I love that story. Uh, Devin wants to know how did the TV show start? Just very quickly. I was getting getting a reputation as a um, enthusiastic, high energy, entertaining, and practical speaker all over the Northwest at a time when there was a lot of little do-it-yourself TV shows percolating. And there was a flurry of little companies, production companies that came to me and wanted to produce a TV show, a Rick Steves Europe TV show. Most of them I just blew off because I thought, this is a pipe dream, it'll never happen. But a a group called Small World Productions uh, uh, contacted me and they really knew our stuff and I liked them and uh, it sounded like they knew what they were doing. And um, I said yes, and uh, we worked together for 10 years and it was tough to break through. But uh, back then, you know, I'm my window of a career has been perfect for small people being able to make a big TV show. You can do it now, or you could do it for the last decades. Now, as broadcast goes down and streaming goes up, I, I hang out with a lot of TV producers, and it's a frustrating time because it's hard to get the traction that we got back in the old days. It's easier to get something out there, but to get something out there that everybody's watching. That's the challenge. And I was able to do that as a small player through public television and then doing the same thing for 30 years. If it's any good, you succeed. And what I noticed in, in watching those early shows, you know, nowadays there's there's a lot of travel hosts now, but you were one of the first ones. And what really struck viewers, I think, was the fact that they could see you were a traveler and you were talking to them. You were the host. You were a traveler. Yeah. Um, and and I, this is not meant as any kind of rap on you, but you weren't slick. You were no. just you yeah. and you were talking to them. And I think that's kind of what what came through with with and, and, and helped to make it a success. Well, thanks, Gene. And there was no gimmick. You know, it was just this is travel. We love travel. You can do it. I'm your I, I'm your I'm your guinea pig. I learned from this. You can learn from me. Now get over there and do it. Yeah. Michael would like you to address the language language barriers on those early trips. How necessary is it to know the local language? Gene. Well, nowadays it's so much easier. And I don't just mean Google apps. I mean, nowadays, most people in Western Europe at least speak not only a little English, they speak pretty darn good English. Mm -hmm. But when we went over there, it really was a very different world. I mean, you know, they talk about how the world, you know, I, I swear the world back then was like the circumference was 50% bigger. In other words, it was a big world and we were small little people. And I just remember that, you know, Rick, you knew a little German. I knew a little Spanish, a little high school Spanish. My high school Spanish helped me know a little bit of high school French and, and a little bit of Italian. But for the most part, we were struggling a lot when we were over there. I remember, didn't you and I get on a train one time? We thought we were going to Sorrento. And then we got a few stops down there and we went, no, this train is going to Salerno. Yeah. And we were going a completely different way and we had to get off and get back on. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that because we were rubes. I'm saying it because back then the language barrier was like the Berlin Wall. It was tall. And, a lot and of times we had to make our best and make our way as best we could. And there wasn't much information. Like now we have information, everything you need. There's too much information. But back then, I remember we'd come into a town, we'd get on a bus, hoping to go to the center of town. We wouldn't know where the center of town was. We'd have to stay on the bus until it went through the center of town. And then there was no more town. And then that would help us know where the center of town was. And then you'd get on the bus going back halfway and you'd go, this must be the center of town. Let's get out here. That's all we knew. It was like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but just to finally address that, that question, how much, how much uh, of another language do you need to know? You probably don't need to know much at all, but it's always really nice to learn the polite words. You know, hello, Absolutely. thank you, please, and so on. And Europeans really appreciate that when you take that little step. You know, you, you, you find him. yourself in a place where they don't speak English. You found yourself a back door. There you well, go. You're right. And Gene, you, you called my attention to because I just have always it just seems like we, we, it's always been easy to communicate. But no, in the 1970s. An educated person did not necessarily speak English. You know, I mean, people didn't travel so much. You could have a big world if you spoke Italian 
or Spanish. And if you went to Spain or Italy, you're very likely in a town where nobody speaks English uh, that you run into. Now I often say anybody who's young, well-educated or in tourism will speak English. But back then, that was not necessarily the case. All right. Uh, Susanna wants to know, did you ever have any major disagreements during your travels and how did you handle it? Jean. <laughs> um, I'm sure we did. That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, we, I would put it this way. Rick, I defer to Rick, perhaps even more than I should, but he's right more often than not, and he knew more about Europe. Huh. Um, but did we have disagreements? Well, anytime you travel, I mean, anytime I've traveled with a travel partner, no. you're in close quarters and you're always going to kind of be button heads. But, you know, I, I honestly, Rick, you know, that picture of you and me on the on the border at India, yeah. that I think more than anything sums up our, our, our travel partnership. We were always kind of knowing that as hard as the times got, you're kind of in this, we're in this together. And yeah. you got to kind of make it make it happen. And I think that that photo sort of captures it. What, think, what's your take on it? What do you think? I, I think I can be annoying by fighting. Um, yeah, I'll agree with that. Fight, <laughs> <laughs> no. I can be annoying by being um, aggressively positive, I think, just because I don't want to let myself get down. And it's probably no fun to be with me when things are going wrong, because I'm just like loopy and trying to say, no, it's going to be OK. When, when really there's problems going on here. And, but we always had strength and safety in our partnership. If one, if, thankfully, we didn't both get sick at the same time. We, we both got sick you know, now and then, and the other person would, would pick up the slack for us. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we were, yeah. so po we were so poor and overwhelmed by the world that we, we were like two little rhesus monkeys hugging each other. <laughs> yeah. When we traveled across to Asia, I got dysentery. I, I mean, I came home and weighed 128 pounds. Yeah. And at my, at my worst, we were in Kabul. And mm -hmm. I just remember, I was so weak, and I couldn't do anything. And all I did was sit in the in the hotel room. And I, I was reading the, the memoirs of Nikita Khrushchev, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and I just remember that you made sure that I got that the hotel owner or that you took care of me. And I was really grateful for that mm -hmm. and helped me survive through it. It was scary. I mean, yeah. you, you don't know when you live now, what it was like to go to India as a 22 year old with no money, with no safety net. I mean, not that we are great adventurers, you know, I mean, it was just vagabonds, hippies on the road. But I mean, it was kind of scary. It was pretty bold to do that. Uh, you can't just, you know, nowadays, if any, if you ever get in trouble, you just pick up your phone and you're connected yeah. to the world. Yeah. Back then, we were on the dark side of the moon. You could we, not hardly even find a pay phone. We, you couldn't contact anybody. It really was you out there. And and that has that's a fund. I would say the, the cell phone is the fundamental change that yeah. has happened to travel in the last 25 years that has that's fundamentally altered what what travel is like we would both sit uh, as we approached a border three hours before the border on the way to india we'd put our bag on our lap and go through everything to make sure nothing was planted in there that could get us arrested at the border and then we wouldn't let anybody touch our bag we'd keep our eyes on it until we got to the border because it routinely somebody was put some drugs on their bag and then the police would find it and they, they wouldn't throw you in jail. They'd just take half of your money to let you go. Yeah. And we, we couldn't afford that. <laughs> and gosh, when you say it and I, and I think about it, I go, my God, we were crazy yeah. because it, we really, it wasn't, we did it. It wasn't that big a deal. We were doing it. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of surprised when I look back on it now, but we, yeah. I, I think it's just the, the ignorance of being young. I'm so thankful we were ignorant because, you know, we had to buy tickets from a bucket shop in Delhi to fly to London. We had to spend our whole wad to get back to London in a scary little hole in the wall travel agency. They could sell you a worthless ticket, take your cash, and you could come back the next day and they'd say, who are you? 
and, and we would be like uh, at the mercy of the embassy somewhere. I don't know what we would have done, but uh, we dodged those bullets and we stuck together and we learned from the experience. Well, a lighthearted question for you, Rick, where is the first place you want to take Atlas? Wow, that's a great question. I'd love to take Atlas on the best of Europe in 22 days trip, that same circle, which just the greatest hits. Atlas is my 14 month old grandson. I'll wait until he's <laughs> about 10 times that old, but uh, I would love to do that. Uh, Jean, can you imagine grandchildren? We've We've traveled with our kids. We've introduced our kids to the Eiffel Tower and to a crepe and a cannoli and to a nice bottle of wine. I'll never forget uh, taking Andy to appreciate, you know, some of the finer points of life in Europe. And now he introduces me to the finer points of life in Europe. It's just such a beautiful cycle. And when you said best of Europe tour, I took my child on mm -hmm. essentially two best of Europe tours. They're, they're kind mm -hmm. of split in half. Yep. And I'm not, you know, having been a tour guide, I thought the last thing in the world I want to do is be on a tour, on a Rick Steves tour, but we took, uh, but we've taken several of the tours and we loved them. And That's I great. was, and I was very glad that I did not have to be the tour guide. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Uh, this is for you, Gene. Speaking of um, being the tour guide, in 1998 in Vernazza, on your birthday, there was a surprise party. And Laura Welch would like to say what an amazing guide you were and how your teachings rippled throughout all your tour members' lives, everyone that mm. you shared your passion and your teachings with. Thank you, Laura. I remember you. I remember that tour. I remember that party. That was one of the, the happy moments of my life. It was during that time, and I remember uh, that that I that uh, I stayed at the apartment of those people that hosted the tour, Monica and Massimo, and I stayed in their apartment overlooking the beautiful breakwater in Vernadza. So, Laura, thank you for that memory. That's wonderful. Hey, this has been so much fun, Gene. I, I remember when we cooked up this idea, uh, I, I thought, what a, what a cool idea. It's 50 years and all that. And uh, Thank you for, for, for gathering these slides together and uh, thanks for your uh, sharing this evening with us. Lisa, beautiful job moderating. And uh, uh, next week, remember Monday Night Travel, it's back onto the every Monday schedule now. Next week, we're going to the uh, Scottish Islands and that's gonna be a great evening. And right now, I just wanna thank Gene Openshaw, uh, thank all of our Monday Night Travel crew and thank you for joining us and wish you happy travels, thanks.